So, please welcome Lasse. Thank you. So let me, does the microphone work? Yeah. Good, because I don't hear it. So let me ask you one question first. Who here is a product owner? Well, a couple of you. Anyone who is not a product owner, but works with a product owner, being a team member, scrum master, or something like that? OK. Looks like the other half of the room. So I'm here to talk a little bit about the product owner role. In my opinion, it's slightly neglected. Um, in Scrum, people focus a lot on the team, on the Scrum Master, but not always so much on the product owner itself. However, the product owner is, in my opinion, probably the most important role. Because even if you have the greatest team in the world, if that doesn't have a direction on where to go, what's the point? Your team is producing a lot of nice product, but if it's the wrong product, what's the point? So I'm going to talk about three things. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a product owner, so that we have a common understanding on that. Then I'm going to give you examples of, let's say, product owner anti-patterns or bad product owners that I've seen over the years. Some are from me personally that I've seen while I coach companies. Others are from colleagues, and some are from other sources. At the end, I will talk a little bit about um, how you can become a better product owner, what kind of things you might need, what are the characteristics of one, and how to develop yourself. If we have the time, hopefully we have, I will give you a couple of tools that you can use. So quickly first, what is a product owner? I took the definition from the Scrum Guide, which is, says the product owner is responsible for maximizing the value of the product and the work of the development team. The product is the sole person responsible for managing the product backlog. OK. What does that mean? Um, for me, a product owner is someone who is kind of between two different worlds. On the one side, he's talking to the customers, perhaps stakeholders, and these kind of people. And on the other side, he's working a lot with a team. And in the team here, I mean a development team, a team that produces product. So he's between two worlds. On the one hand, he's in the world of the problem, which is what the stakeholders have, and the customers, and so on. They have some problem that needs to be solved. On the other hand, he's in the world of the solution, which is provided by the team. And he kind of works between those two. One of the important things that he does is provide direction. Without direction, the team doesn't really know where to go, and that direction comes from the stakeholders. When talking about product owners, it's often talked about return on investment. That ties back to the backlog itself quite a bit. Because if you're in the, in the business of creating products, you're investing money, and you want a return, right? You have money to spend. When you sell your product, you get money back. Um, one of the important jobs of a product owner here is to try to maximize the return that we get on our investment. If you have to pick one responsibility for the product owner, I'd say it's maximize the return on investment of our product. This is often done through ordering or prioritizing a product backlog, but sometimes also through other means. Often a team you have a team as a product owner that has a certain amount of capacity to build things. So the challenge for the product owner is, how do I best use that capacity available to us to create the most possible value we can? In many traditional projects, you just have a big specification and you just build, build, build. Half of the stuff you probably never needed. So if you want to maximize your return on investment, don't build things you don't need. The question here, of course, is how do you know what to build and what not to build? That's always a difficult thing. 
Another important thing for the product owner is to provide this kind of direction and leadership to the team. As I said before, if the team doesn't know where to go, what's the point? However, I want to remind everyone that the product owner is not a solo thing. He's not working alone. He does have a team to help him. In other contexts, there might be a product owner team, and so on. So even though the product owner responsibilities sound quite that he has a lot of things to do, and that is a quite challenging role, he doesn't have to do everything alone. Responsibility does not mean that he has to do everything by himself. You can be responsible for things, but someone else helps you to do the things. Okay. So now some pattern, anti-patterns for product owners. At least these are what I've seen over the years. One of my favorites, the no power product owner. Anyone seen this before? Yeah, a couple of you. Product owner has no ability to decide almost anything. He always likes, sorry, but I have to go first ask. Or the other option is that even though he makes a decision, his decision gets second guessed all the time, meaning you're the product owner, you made a decision by prioritizing your backlog, and then half hour later, the VP of development comes along and says, no, this doesn't do, I want it like this. Anyone seen that before? Yeah. That causes a lot of problems. What would these problems be? Think about it. If you're a team member and you have a product owner that cannot make any decisions, or his decisions get changed all the time, why would you bother even asking him for a decision? Right? You know that half an hour later someone else comes along and says something else. Often there are more than one person changing these decisions. So you get an even more interesting thing. You get conflicting de decisions as a team member, for example. You know, one VP comes along and says, I want this. The other one comes and says, I want this. And now you're sitting there going like, eh, who do I need to follow here? And you can't go ask the product owner because he doesn't know. And he doesn't have the power to decide. So that erodes the confidence of a team in their product owner. And that happens quite a lot. What are reasons for this? So reasons can be that the, product, the project that the product owner is working on doesn't have enough management attention. You know, it's not an important thing. That might be one thing. Another thing could be that he has the sponsorship of the wrong person or the, a person at the wrong level. You know, someone, someone who is um, giving him the authority for that project, but that pro person is actually the wrong person to give that authority because there's someone else who has even more authority and they override him. Another reason might be that the management just doesn't trust the product owner. You know, well, why should I let him decide if I don't trust him? So that happens also quite a bit. Another one is the too busy product owner. Anyone seen that before? You know, the product owner who's on five different projects at the same time, product owner mostly, he never has the time to do anything. If you have been a team member, a symptom often is that you come to a sprint planning, and the beginning of the sprint planning, the product is furiously writing stuff on post-its or in an electronic tool trying to create some user stories for the next sprint. Because he didn't have any time to prepare. In the extreme case, you can have a product owner that doesn't exist at all. You know, he doesn't have any time. The team is completely without any product owner. So consequences of this kind of behavior often is that the product backlog isn't groomed. Um, and when the product backlog isn't groomed, you don't have clear stories on what to do, and the team just does something. And often they do things that are not absolutely necessary, and so on. That creates a lot of stuff that has been built that actually wasn't needed, and is a lot of waste of money. The half product owner. With this I mean you have a product owner who has been reduced to almost nothing else than a user story writing machine. You know, he's just there to write user stories and give them to the team. 
but actually a lot of the decisions and 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 then the responsibilities are completely somewhere else. This is a bit related to the no power product owner, so he doesn't really have that much power, but it's slightly different in the thing that yes, he does make often decisions on how the product backlog is ordered, but he has no power on anything else than the user stories and the backlog, and he can't affect the big picture, the vision, anything on releases, and these kind of things. Because that's decided somewhere else. It limits the product owner's power quite a bit. This often is a consequence of organizations just having existing roles, and they create a product owner in their, in their company, and then they give like something to him. And often the easiest thing to give is just, okay, you take care of the backlog and everything else stays with our product manager or whoever else we have in the company, and they decide everything. The far, far away product owner. What might that be? Anyone worked with teams in other countries? Yeah. The biggest time difference I've ever seen with a product owner and his team is 10 hours. That's huge. It means they don't have any common time during the day where they really can sit down at the same time. It meant the product owner communicated with the team only by email, more or less. The only time he actually showed up was for a sprint planning, and that's it. So any time you had any question to a product owner, what did you have to do? You write an email. How long does it take to get an answer to an email from a product owner that is 10 hours away? Until the next day. What happens? Everything slows down. Communication is really difficult because you have a question, you send an email, next day you get an answer, ooh, he didn't understand my question, so I have to rephrase my question, send it again, wait another day, you get another answer, and perhaps you got the answer you looked for. Makes things really difficult. Unfortunately, this is quite common in big companies, especially when they have the product owner somewhere in the US, or UK, or something like that, the team in India, or somewhere else. You know, this typical kind of offshoring thing. How about product owner by committee? So there's no single product owner that can decide anything. It's a big committee. I saw this once in a bank. So made decisions really tricky. Because they always had to make unanimous decisions as a committee and decide everything together. And if you have five, six people sitting in a committee, deciding on a common vision or what is our release plan going to be and what we're going to do next is quite tricky. It's a lot of talking, a lot of politics, and these kind of things. Takes a long time to get anything done again. Anyone heard the phrase death by committee? Yeah. So, that kind of situation. Proxy product owners. What's a proxy product owner? Well, you have a person who acts as a proxy product owner, um, as a replacement for the real product owner who's somewhere else. Often this is because the product owner is far away. You know, he might be in the US, so if the team is in Lithuania, then you have a product owner here representing the US product owner. Um, that's kind of a typical case for that. Or the product owner is just so busy that it doesn't have any time, so they create a proxy product owner to replace the busy product owner, even though he's in the same office. Anyone know the game um, Broken Telephone? Happens often when you have proxy product owners. Because he's just a proxy, you know? By definition, he goes ask the real product owner. So he gets a question from the team, understands maybe 50% of it, goes to the product owner who understands 50% of that, and then comes the answer back where 50% is understood again, and you get a lot of misunderstandings. Makes no sense. Solution often is get the product owner more closer to the team or rethink how you're organizing your organization. If you have a product owner 10 hours away, maybe you should have the team closer hour-wise or the product owner closer, whatever. So let's talk a bit about characteristics of a good product owner. What kind of things might be important here? Hmm? 
The first thing is a product owner has to have authority. If he doesn't have the empowerment and the mandate from the organization to make decisions, how can he be a product owner? If he's responsible for the return on investment, he's responsible for the product backlog. If he does not have the power to decide on what is our order of prioritization of that backlog, how can he act as a product owner? By deciding the order on the backlog, he's automatically deciding return on investment and all other things. So he has to have at least that much authority or empowerment by the organization. It doesn't mean that a product owner has to have limitless power. So he can have a certain kind of mandate that, okay, we have this product vision, you have this amount of money available, which usually means you have a team and some time, and you can use that. As long as you don't need more, don't bother the higher management. Just report every X weeks or something by showing them working product or something to keep them happy. But if he doesn't have that, it doesn't work. Another important thing is for a product owner, he has to have the knowledge about what he's doing. He has to have the knowledge of what it means to be a product owner. But he also needs the knowledge about the product he's building. He doesn't have to have the technical knowledge on how to build it, but he has to understand the domain that the product is in to make good decisions. You know, if you build a banking software, banking system, the product owner should know anyth something about banking systems, what is important for stakeholders. If he's completely without any knowledge, it gets really difficult. The last thing that he needs is time. So in my opinion, most product owners need to have full time for one project that is non-trivial. With non-trivial, I mean you have a decent-sized team, at least five people, that is working on this one project. And you're building really a product. You need a lot of time to think about what is our strategy, how are we going to build this, or what are we are going to build, how are we going to prioritize things, and so on. There are also some other things that a product owner can or needs that are good for him. One is, he has to have a vision. And if he doesn't have a vision, at least he has to be able to get a vision from somewhere. He has to be a person who can lead people, not manage people. Product owner, in my opinion, is much more about leadership than it is about management. You know, you show direction. You build a goal of, this is where we want to go. If you're the team, this is what we want to build. I can tell you what the customer wants. I have no clue how to get there, but you guys are the experts. We'll figure it out. So he has to provide this kind of leadership to them. A product owner also has to be a good communicator. He's going to talk a lot. He's going to talk with the stakeholders, the customers, the team members, and so on. So if he can't communicate with them, it gets difficult. Another thing he will need is negotiation skills. Ever had this situation, if you have been a product owner, where you have multiple stakeholders that are in conflict with each other? You know, one business unit wants this, the other business unit wants that, and you can't build both things at the same time. They might be mutually exclusive, meaning if you build that, the other one becomes impossible. And you're sitting between those two guys, and you have to make a decision. You have to negotiate with both parties on what we're actually going to do in what order and what makes sense for the company. That's something you need to do. So now let's get some tips on becoming a good product owner. Know yourself. What do you, what kind of person are you? Are you the right person for this? What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? You know, if you know you're, that you're not a good communicator, learn that, that you're not a good communicator and that you have to work on that. Find out what you're good at and what you're not so good at. Without that, it is difficult to start. But once you know yourself, 
Think about how you can develop yourself. Because no one is born a product owner or a good one, so you need to learn. If you know that, for example, negotiation or communication is your weakness, go study that. But for that, of course, you need to first know where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and then you can start developing yourself in, those, in the right directions. Get the right authority in that organization. If you're nominated a product owner, but you're not getting the authority to be a product owner, you're in deep trouble. You know, you, you'll be named the product owner, but you can't decide anything, and you're just there sitting between two different camps and having a lot of problems. Now, this I think is a quite important thing. Get someone to help you. If you don't have the experience, and if you're a starting product owner, you don't have the experience yet, get someone who can help you. Ask a Scrum Master to coach you, if you have an experienced Scrum Master. If you don't have anyone in the organization, find someone outside the organization who can help you. I've coached a couple of product owners lately, and found that without, that kind, without coaching, it's really difficult for them to, when they come from a traditional project, product management kind of world, to get, get their head around, okay, we are working with a backlog, we're doing iterative and incremental product development. And what does it actually mean? Often they go like, okay, we just need everything. You know, build everything, and once we have everything, we release. But actually what you want to do is try to figure out what is the smallest possible thing that we can build that makes any sense and try to release that. If not to the public, at least internally, to get some feedback to know that you're on the right track building the right thing. However, if you have never really like cut a product down to the bare minimum, that is difficult. Often you're too much like, okay, we need everything, you're under pressure, you have the VP of something or directors coming at you saying, we need this, we need this, we need this, and I want everything. And then you need to start cutting it down. If you have someone there who's sitting next to you, um, helping you, um, asking you questions, do you really need that? What would happen if you only built half of this feature? If you have someone asking these kind of questions, you start thinking more about these things and learning on how to cut these things down. Also, if you think about writing user stories, if you have never written user stories, it is tricky. Anyone had any problems uh, splitting user stories down to small user stories? It's not an easy thing to make really small user stories that a team can use. It is something you need to learn. And often you just sit there and go like, I have no idea how to cut this down. You know, as a user, I want to do this on the user interface, and that's what the user story says, and I don't know how to get it smaller. That's where someone comes in that can help you. So, a couple of tools that I think are really important to get you started. The first one is, have a good product vision. Know your big goal. Believe in it. Have a team that believes in it. I lately had a customer who had a really, they did have a product vision. However, the team did not believe in it. So what happened? Well, probably would have happened. Um, so the first thing happened is the team was thinking like, okay, this makes no sense for us to build this pro product. It was a product. This is never going to sell. Um, this, since this is the big new direction of our company, um, we are really afraid now that the company is going to go bankrupt because this is not going to sell. So what was the level of motivation in the team to build that thing? close to zero. They were constantly questioning everything, like, this makes no sense. Let's go back and build the old product, what we were doing. Makes much more sense. 
So the product owner had to constantly argue and fight with the team on the direction, and the team wasn't really involved in building a great product. So create a vision that is engaging and binds the people to that project or product. There are good examples of great visions over time. Look at politicians, what they talk about. Anyone know the I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King? The Kennedy speech on going to the moon? Those are visions. They give direction. They motivate a team to do things that they don't think are possible. If anyone has read the book by Dan Pink about, uh, called Drive or seen his TED talk, yeah? he talks a lot about motivation. Where does motivation come from in the IT industry, if you do software? There are two big groups of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. Extrinsic motivation would be, I give you a lot of money if you work for me. The other one is intrinsic, which comes from inside. I do this because I really believe in it, I want to do it. Which one do you think is more important when creating software? Intrinsic or extrinsic motivation? Intrinsic motivation. Having a great vision that people believe in and are fired up to do. I think our product is great and I really believe in it and I want to see this happen. That helps a lot in creating this intrinsic motivation. People have this need to belong to something big. So if you look at people like to belong to different kinds of clubs, associations, you have Agile Lithuania and these kind of things. People like to belong to something, be a part of something bigger. Being part of an uh, interesting project is such a thing also. And that motivates people a lot. Another thing is, really think about what are requirements. Now with requirements here I mean, what is the problem? What is the customer need you're trying to solve? I've seen a lot of product owners who go directly to user stories. You know? This is, as a user, I want, when I do this, that this happens because. That's more like a solution. But what is the problem you're trying to solve? For example, I'm the customer and I'm coming to you and I said, I want a bridge. What I'm asking for here? I'm asking for a solution. You, as the product owner, should then ask, why do you need a bridge? Perhaps there's another solution for you that is much better than a bridge. I'm not, as a customer, I wouldn't be the expert on solutions. I assume that the supplier is. So you need to drill down into what is the actual need that you're trying to fulfill here. This is traditional requirement elicitation. Nothing new. Find out what the real deep need is of whoever you're working with. Once you know what the need is, figure out what solution options you have. Try to figure out multiple solutions. Don't just pick the first one that comes to mind and start building. Spend a little time thinking, okay, we can do this and this and that. Which might be the best option for us to build? If you do these kind of things, you often end up with a much better, higher quality product that much better fulfills the customer's needs. And often you end up with a much more value for the investment that you made. Because you didn't spend time on things that you actually didn't need to build. So here's a concrete tool to help you a little bit. Most of you probably know planning poker. Right? Okay. And quite a few had the problem that you have stakeholders who are, as a program, you have multiple stakeholders who are in conflict with each other. One stakeholder wants one thing, the other one wants another thing. They value different things. And you need to get them to agree on a common th priority of things. Let's say you have big epics that you need to prioritize in order to create a release plan. However, it is difficult to get them to agree what is actually important for this release, the different stakeholders, because 
Business guy A says, I want this, and business guy B says, I want this, and we don't have time to do everything. So one of the tools we often use is what we call the business value game. I take it these look familiar. These are similar to playing poker cards. Just the same numbers, basically, except that it's 100, 200, 300, 500, 800, and so on. So every number is just be multiplied by 100. Business people like big numbers. You know, If you give them a, this is value 1, they're going to say, why is it so little? If you give them a, this is value 100, they're much more happy. So just multiply by, by 100. Same cards. You can take your playing poker cards, just add a couple of zeros on them, and you're done. And similar to playing poker, you play it. So you have relative value estimation now, instead of relative, let's say, I wouldn't say cost estimation, but size estimation, which would be in planning poker. So you're estimating value. So if you have multiple user stories, or epics, or requirements or something, you can ask them, in relation to each other, how valuable are these stories? If this, this epic is value 300, how much is this other story? And you can have the multiple pro stakeholders pick their card on their own. They have to think, OK, from my perspective, if that's the 300, OK, this is a 500. Now, what you will get, of course, is that the one has the 500, the other one has the 100, and one has the 2,000. You get the different numbers, exactly like in planning poker. What do you do? You have a discussion on that. Why is it only 100? Why is it 2,000? Why is it suddenly like so big difference in value for the company or from your point of view? And you use that as a tool to facilitate a discussion that will hopefully lead to a common understanding on what is actually valuable for us. If not, then OK, we at least learned that there's a big difference. We have more information. We have at least discussed this. And we know that there's a difference in opinion in, in what is valuable for us. And you can use that information as a product owner to better prioritize than your backlog. There are some other things you can use. I mentioned this before. Build, try to figure out what is the minimal marketable product that makes any sense for your customers. And in this, be really strict with yourself. Do I really need this? Question every single functionality that you have in there. Do we need this? Can we leave it out? In most cases, you can cut out a lot of things if you just think like, okay, we're doing an internal beta release. This is not actually yet going to the full market or something, we actually don't need an authentication. Why do we need to log in, have a username and password? Completely unnecessary. All our users are company employees anyway. There's fake data only in the system. So let's forget the whole thing and focus on the actual functionality that the product is, is supplying. Makes the product more simple. Of course, before we release it to the customer, we would add stuff that we still need. But you can do things like this. There are a lot of other things you can cut out. You can cut out um, if you have a business process in there. You don't need the whole business process necessarily in your tool that is modeling that process. You can have just a part of it or an extremely simplified version that demonstrates the overall process but actually doesn't have the data in there yet. And that might make sense. Get, around, uh, get away from the thinking that you need everything in order to have a product that someone can use. Often you can get away with quite a simple system that doesn't have that many things. And then try to build them in small increments, of course. So if you have one minimal, then you add another small step on top of that. If you add another couple of things, and we get a little bit more, and then more, and then more. And every time you get more and more feedback on what we're building, are we going in the right direction? Does it make sense to continue like this, or should we do something else? Of course, there are also a lot of other things. 
So don't forget all the other things that might be out there. Um, think of what you might need. Go to some training, listen to other talks, read some books. Because you need a lot of things to be a good product owner. The, I'm not saying that this is the only things you need. You need a lot of more things. Well, these are some things to help you at least start and move along a little bit. Since we still have six minutes, what questions do you have? What do you want to know more about the product owner? Uh, what are the relations between product owner and product manager? That is a difficult thing to answer. Depends on what your company is. In some places, there's no difference because it's the same thing. In others, it's, it is, there is a difference. Um, in some places where I've been, the difference is that uh, the product manager is a more high level, a little bit more on the strategic side than on the tactical side. Um, maybe talking more to sales and these kind of things. But in other places, it's the same person doing all the things. So it depends very much. In my opinion, having the same person as, not having a separate product manager and, and product owner works, in my opinion, probably best, but it's a lot more trickier because you have a lot more responsibilities and more things to do than if you have separate things. But they can if it's combined. Yes, they can. I've seen companies that have them combined. Um, in those cases, the, the product owners are non-technical people, and they've been product managers before who started to be, be take over the product owner role itself. Um, and that worked actually quite well. Because they didn't mess up with the team in the technical side too much and they just gave like really high level direction and, 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 and quite big user stories and worked a lot with the team to actually then create the backlog and all the other things that they need. Um. Can marketing people be good product owners? Uh, because, well, from them sometimes come requirements and new mm -hmm. ideas for products. I don't see a reason why they couldn't be. Um, depends on your context again, if it makes sense with the people you have. Being a good product owner depends a lot on the personality and the person itself. Does he take over that role as a real product owner? Or does he just do something else? Yeah, so I'm assuming you have uh, that they're still creating software product in the end, right? Yeah. yeah. So, as I said, it depends on the guy. If, he's a, if he can provide direction on where the product is going, what kind of functionality our users want, and provide that to the development team, then sure, why not? But if he's just thinking about marketing campaigns and, and never about, okay, what is the vision for our product? What is our long-term strategy in where we want to take our product? Um, what kind of new markets we want to explore and these kind of things, then perhaps he's not that the right person in that case. So, depends. Uh, what do you think would be the best <clears throat> what do you think would be the best direction uh, to coach the customers to tell you the problem that they're having not, and not try and tell you the solution? Because they're usually afraid that you won't get the right solution and they give you the solutions that you have to implement instead of telling you the, the, the problems that they have. Mm. So kind of how, how to get the, the problem out of the customer? Yes, how to, how, to, how to make them trust you and, and get the problem, get them, get them to tell you the problem instead of the supply you with a solution that you have to implement. Yeah. That's tricky. <laughs> Start building a good... Yeah, um, you need to have a, uh, a relationship with your customer that, that he can actually trust you to provide sensible solutions because a lot of customers mistrust their suppliers, especially if it's like different companies. And they go like, they're, they're just trying to exploit us and get as much money out of them as, as, as possible, so they're going to build the most complicated solution they can think of because it has the biggest price tag. Um, 
So, assuming you have a good relationship with him and you have the trust there, which you probably not yet have, um, then, it, then you could just uh, start talking to him and ask these things. If not, I would focus on building the relationship first, to build up some trust that, yes, we're here to actually help you. We have your best interest in mind. And then the things start getting easier. As long as you don't have the trust in the relationship, difficult. You could try to do some workshops around that topic. You could try to observe your customer and what he's doing. Say, OK, in order to build a system, we have to come to your company and see what, how you would use this tool to fig and then figure out what from there. But in the end, the customer still might say, OK, yeah, um, but we want you to build this. Yeah, and uh, to change his mind, you need to get him to trust you that you actually know a better solution than what he had in mind. So. Okay, uh, how much the current product uh, product owner should be knowledgeable in the solution, existing solution itself? Do you mean technical uh, knowledge or just uh, let's say domain, functional domain knowledge? More for not technical, but let's say uh, what currently functions exist, what it does, uh, how much it does, how it do, yeah. let's say these things. Yeah. Um, so assuming you're taking over the product role and you have an existing product that you're the product owner for, um, yes, you should know quite well what that product actually does right now. Um, because otherwise it's really difficult to start building on top of that. And, and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do next if you don't even know where you are right now. However, you don't need to know technical details about the system. Um, product owner can be totally non-technical, so. And last question. Um, it's more of a, I guess, philosophical kind of thing. Your, your thoughts on uh, product owner, if you're working for a specific client on client side versus a product owner on supplier side, so pros and cons on, of these situations. Okay. Um, I'd say it depends a lot on the client. Now, if you have a client who is not in the business of building software and has no experience in, in, in building software before, Getting them to actually act as a product owner can be tricky because you need to teach them quite a bit about that role, um, about how software is built. Okay, we're doing iterations and we have something called a product backlog with user stories and yes, you will be responsible for creating that backlog. If you can get him to learn that and do that, it will probably work. However, a lot of these kind of customers that don't do that, they don't want to do, even learn, and they just say to you, I, want, I have this problem, please solve it for me. In that case, I would say the product owner is much better on the supplier side and have the customer act as a stakeholder. So, I'd say it's often nice if the product owner is on the customer side because he has a much better knowledge on, on where they actually want to take the product, but it has the challenges of having the knowledge. So, I guess we need to end. So, thanks for last. I think you oh, will answer you. more questions during break. It's a little gift for you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>